Okay, so thank you very much everybody for connecting here with us today. Um, I have the very big pleasure of introducing today's webinar organized by DP Group. Today, along with all the speakers that you can see in the screen, we will go to analyze the key business trends across economies. And specifically, uh, today we will focus on Asia Pacific uh, and especially on China, India and Vietnam. My name is Gaia Rizzi, I'm marketing manager of DP Group. And now before uh, moving forward with the really interesting panel discussions that we will have with our esteemed speakers here today, I will just get a little bit of uh, your time a couple of minutes to explain you who DP Group is and why we're doing this webinar today, just to give you a little bit of context. And then afterwards, I will uh, leave the floor to the rest of the panelists. So DP Group, for those of you who never participated to our webinars before, uh, we're an international consulting group and our mission is to be present in every business capital of the world uh, to make the global business environment better through our work. And as you can see here, we at now have offices, Italy, Dubai, India, Vietnam, and China. And our structure, so DP Group was founded by Carlo D'Andrea and Matteo Gio, and as of today counts four companies. So we have D'Andrea and Partners Legal Counsel, which is our law firm, and it is specialized in a very broad practice areas from corporate and commercial law, IPR, investments, dispute resolution, and so on. Uh, PhD Advisory Tax and Accounting, as the name says, uh, it's our accounting firm specialized in tax, co tax compliance, treasury, financial supervision, and overall business consulting. Eastern Communication and Events that I have the pleasure to represent here today. So our agency focuses on social media management, public relations and events planning with a specific focus on the Chinese market. And then our latest company, Chance and Better Education. Um, our team here, they support both students and C uh, level managers in their, let's say educational path, maybe language courses or any other kind of professional and educational uh, programs. So another big part of our group is the practical guides that we publish every year. So here is a collection of the international ones, uh, mostly focused on Vietnam, uh, Belarus, Italy. Then we have a specific select selection for China. And as you can see, the one uh, on the right here, it's our latest one focused on Southwest. And it's the first one of a long series of regional uh, guides focused on China that we will keep uh, publishing throughout the year. And then I also have uh, the very pleasure of showing you our latest guide that we published recently, um, Fada Business in Vietnam, which was available on selected newsstands in Italy and that we published along with Milano Finanza, uh, thanks to our cooperation with Class Editorials. Uh, and finally, to conclude, for any kind of information or assistance that you, that you may need, we have offices in China, Italy, Vietnam, India, and the UAE. And also, uh, today, I am very happy to announce that we uh, just released the communication of our new opening in Beijing office. So for anything that you may need also in northern China, from today onwards, we are there. Without any further ado, I thank you once again very much for joining us today. And I will leave the word to you, Veronica, uh, who is our colleague connected from Milan for uh, you know, introducing the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Sorry, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thanks, thank you Gaia. And uh, once again, thanks to all the participants of this webinar, uh, speakers and uh, attendees. As mentioned, DP Group uh, through its affiliated companies is uh, present in uh, many countries of the world, including China, India and Vietnam, countries on which we are dedicating our focus uh, today. We strongly believe in uh, the importance of being part uh, and being close to the growth of these countries, some of which have uh, already shown their strength, uh, while some are pushing for a rise in the short uh, period. What is sure is uh, that uh, all of them are very competitive in the market and appealing for uh, foreign companies wishing to invest uh, abroad. 
Um, let's start now with uh, our first uh, panel dedicated to China. Uh, I'm glad to welcome Mr. Paolo Bazzoni, who is the chairman of the China-Italy Chamber of Commerce. Uh, please, Paolo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Veronica, and uh, thanks uh, to all the organizers of the group to have this uh, opportunity to share with you some key messages about uh, People Republic of China. And uh, of course, I, uh, I want to extend my greetings to uh, the colleague and friend, uh, Michele, uh, the chairman of the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce, Federal Chamber of Commerce, and Mr. Variale in India, and all the panelists, all the companies present. Uh, <clears throat> I will be, in five minutes, I will try to, uh, let's say, pass some, uh, some messages. China, uh, as you all know, uh, Recover very fast uh, last year, starting second part of the year from the pandemic uh, COVID-19, uh, resulted in a 2020 plus 2.3 GDP growth. Uh, this allowed the, the market of this continent, because China is a continent, it's not a country, to, uh, to boost a path of uh, fast recovery and fast uh, uh, demand of the consumer in the domestic market. Due to what? As always in China, everything is driven by the sanction guidelines from the central governments. And also in this way, the uh, appropriate uh, government, uh, uh, let's say, indication uh, drove the recovery. Three main uh, guidelines. The dual circulation policy. What does it mean? It means that in this particular moment, China is very concentrated on its own domestic market, continue to expand the relation and the uh, export towards the, the countries around the world but with the main focus on the domestic market, the biggest market in the world. This is the first guideline. I will come back later. Second guideline is the transition energy. Transition energy due to the 14 uh, uh, five years plan of the government is the focus of the next 30 years. Decarbonization, it means uh, fasting, investing in, uh, a green economy, on the infrastructure, on the recycle, on the smart cities. This will affect the business, of course, and our companies. Third, quality, 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 a more independent, autonomous, innovating technology in the industry. So with these three guidelines, you can imagine the recovery started very quickly, also supported by local uh, governmental uh, incentives, following three section, three sectors of the macro industry affecting the micro economy. The digital circulation gave an enormous boost at the domestic quality retail luxury consumer goods. The Chinese uh, uh, were not able to travel abroad, so they concentrated their attention into China, but especially on the high quality, top quality uh, retail. This, of course, is uh, a good signal for our companies because Italy means quality. Everything we do, everything we manufacture, everything we produce or we create is quality. We are, uh, we, we, let's say, we, we produce, we engineer a quality solution in the industry, in the, of course, automotive, industrial components, but also into the quality retail, fashion, furniture, design, and luxury goods. And last but not least, uh, we uh, are very uh, top in the lifestyle. 
So all the three assumptions affected positively our business community, our localized company. Yes, because to be in China, you must be localized. Our company here in China, the, the successful company in different uh, uh, sectors and a couple of them today will, uh, will, uh, will have the chance to, to talk about it, uh, are definitely here uh, since at least 10 years. It doesn't mean that we cannot have new companies. Actually, we want to have more companies from Italy, but the importance is to be localized. The introduction of the dual circulation policies gave a lot of boost at the, what we call quality retail. As a Chamber of Commerce strategy, we have uh, offices and we are everywhere in China and we support in this particular moment, the quality retail, um, let's say, uh, demand and the quality retail brands in China. Uh, in some areas, particular areas like Hainan Island, China established a special duty-free zone. Uh, what does it mean? It means that the Chinese can go there, enjoy the vacation and buy like in Italy uh, with a tax-free, with some uh, uh, important incentives, also from a personal and company point of view. This is fantastic for our company. Hainan will become the number one quality retail travel hub, duty-free zone in the world, if it's not yet uh, in this moment. So you can see that quality retail, fashion, furniture design, and industry. The core of our industry in China, uh, we have uh, almost uh, above 600 companies, part of the Chamber of Commerce, 50% of them are uh, involved and localized in the uh, mechanic, industrial components, automotive. So the core industry of the Italian industrial uh, creativity. But then we have a transition energy. We just uh, finished to organize a very important forum uh, with the participation of the Italian and Chinese company. And uh, we realized that in this moment, the, uh, the motto is investing in transition energy. So as we are leader in Europe, we can be leader also in China. Uh, I don't want to uh, continue anymore because uh, I prefer to leave the space to the companies, but uh, I hope to have uh, given you a kind of a snapshot of what's going on now in China, definitely sparkling. The year end will uh, finish probably above 8% GDP growth. I'm ready for any question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paolo. Thank you. And uh, I uh, think now it's time to enter into our China panel and our Mandy Du. Senior Associ Associate of the Andrea and Partner Legal Council will give us a general introduction and uh, we'll welcome our panelists. Thank you, Mandy. Introduction. Um, good, good morning and good afternoon to everyone here. Uh, this is Mandy from the Andrea Partners Legal Council. Uh, this is my great honor to attend the discussion today. And actually, when we're talking about the business trends in China, we may have focused that the Chinese government has actually paid great attention to improving um, the in investment environment as well as the domestic legislations in the couple, couple recent years. Specifically, actually, the Chinese government has been increasingly focusing on the uh, intellect intellectual property pro protections, uh, personal, personal data, and also certain e-commerce platforms such establishments of the legislations, I believe the Chinese government aims to bring a more healthy and sustainable investment environment in China. So I am looking forward, I am very, very looking forward to hear the practical perspectives from all of our companies today. And I, it is also great, my great honor to introduce our speakers for China panel today. 
Now it's time to move over to India, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Francesco Varreale, who is the Economic Counselor of the Embassy of Italy in New Delhi. Uh, please, Francesco, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased uh, to intervene to this important webinar. And um, I'm very pleased that this webinar is focused on the, these three important countries, China, India, and Vietnam, that are, I think now they are the center of the interest and one of the most center of the interest of Italian companies, European companies. Um, I think there is not much to say about uh, India. Uh, you every, everyone knows that is a very poor uh, in terms of a population, one billion, four hundred million of people, and uh, um, that is an economy, an economy that is growing very fast. Um, of course, um, in the last, uh, um, I, I just want to give you some sh short idea. Uh, India is the third partner of EU. EU is the B is the third partner of India, and uh, with the uh, foreign trade of about 80, 80 million, and uh, that it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's a lot, and uh, grow a lot in the in the uh, in the last uh, in, in the last years. Um, there is uh, uh, everyone knows that now India is facing a very a very complicated time with COVID. We have the second wave that uh, um, it's uh, maybe it's the biggest uh, wave of COVID uh, all over the world, and uh, we reached India reached the peak in uh, fourth of uh, in May six with uh, more about half million of cases. That it's a very a very huge number. Fortunately, uh, the cases of COVID now are decreasing, and. Uh, mm, of course, there is uh, there is a big uncertainty of uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, the recovery of the country um, until. Uh, the, but uh, I think that we can be confident. Uh, we can be confident because India was on me uh, in the world to recover with the biggest recovery rate in uh, in in 2021. Now, of course, there is uncertainty. Uh, also, the International uh, Monetary Fund is uh, revising, uh, maybe will revising the, his, uh, um, his view, but uh, uh, we can be very confident that there, is, there are the basis for uh, the recovery, uh, for recovery. We are thinking about uh, 99.3, 9.8, uh, percent in this year. So I think there is the basis for, uh, for a big recovery. Um, in, Italy, in India, there are, there are already many, uh, many Italian companies. Um, we have uh, about 600 companies uh, with a production plant or with the office in, uh, in India. Uh, but we think that there is space for, uh, in, for more. Uh, before COVID, we had about uh, uh, 9 billion uh, of uh, uh, bilateral trade. And uh, uh, of course, the, uh, the sectors of bilateral trade are, are the same that in other countries, we are thinking to machinery, uh, we are thinking to chemical products, products, we are thinking to style. So uh, I think that uh, uh, these are the main uh, um, sector of, uh, uh, made in Italy, made, um, yeah, made in Italy. Um, as every, every, maybe as you know, in uh, last uh, November, there was a very important meeting uh, uh, amongst, uh, between uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Italy and India. And uh, we, uh, and the two governments decided to adopt an, a common action plan a common action plan that focuses on five uh, strategic uh, sectors uh, that are green economy, uh, food and the healthy safety, infrastructure, 
manufacture, advanced manufacture and lifestyle, design, moda, uh, and, uh, and everything. Uh, I think that in this uh, sector, there are the basis for uh, uh, a, uh, to, uh, a, more, a deeper, deeper uh, cooperation between India and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Italy. And I think that uh, as uh, our, um, the, the president of the uh, Italian Ch Ch China Chamber of Commerce, Chinese Chamber of Commerce told, uh, also, in, in uh, for example, we are working to energy transition here uh, in, in India too, and we think that in this uh, in energy transition in energy transition, Italian companies can add an enormous value to to the uh, to the progress of the country. In India, as you know, is the third country uh, producing uh, pollu emission in the world. But they, uh, they must, they must manufacture the production. And so I think that they are looking for some solution for the decar decarbonization, um, clean, uh, uh, clean energy, uh, uh, electrical, electric uh, transportation. And, and Italian companies can, uh, I think that can, can add some values. So um, we, can, we can be very, positive in looking uh, the future of the cooperation between Italy and India. And I think that in India, there are many opportunities, some, a lot of opportunities for our, for our companies. So I'm very, I'm very pleased that uh, deep, uh, um, that uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, for this um, meeting. And I think that uh, uh, it's very important to continue to uh, to stress, to focus on uh, on the opportunities that there are in, in the business of India and uh, and uh, Italy. Uh, as embassy um, in in India, there is a very big support of institutional support for Italian companies uh, that wants to look at the market. We have the embassy. We have. Uh, two consulates in Mumbai and uh, Cal Calcutta, Kolkata, but uh, we are thinking to open another, another consulate maybe before the end of the year in Bangalore. And uh, we have a, 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 an office of the Italian trade agency in uh, Bangalore and in, uh, sorry, in uh, Mumbai and in Delhi. And uh, we have an Italian chair. The main office is in Dubai, but there are other uh, desks all over India. So there is an, a very important, uh, a very uh, important uh, structure, public support, and uh, we really, we really hope that many, um, many other companies will look at the country in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. And uh, now let's deepen into our uh, India panel with the introduction made by our legal advisor for India, Mrs. Divya Hezra. Thank you, Divya, please. Thank you, Vero, for the introduction. And uh, now without further ado, uh, I would like to start the India panel discussion. Well, to catch on to what Francesco was saying, uh, just to add on to that, uh, India is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, and it's deemed to be the third largest in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, well, in terms of what has led to this steady development, I would say steady policy reforms. The fact that we have a huge population, so there is an active demand for the products, so there is a huge market to cater to. And the fact that the government is continuously reforming the policies that it has its place, the tax policies, the corporate law policies, to have more and more foreign investors investing in the Indian markets. As for the European companies, uh, well, the free trade agreement negotiations between uh, India and the EU were stuck from 2013. But in the year, recent year, in fact, in May 2021, the negotiations have resumed. And I'm sure that once this free trade agreement is negotiated, it will obviously strengthen the ties between European companies and India. 
uh, as for the pandemic, uh, I mean, even though last year was a half of the year was India was in a state of lockdown, but the, India received billions of dollars of foreign direct investment, even in the middle of a pandemic. So I'm sure uh, this year as well, it's a phase, but it will pass. And once that happens, I'm sure our economy will grow and continue to develop and grow. Well, uh, on this note, I start our panel discussion for today. Uh, and actually, the two companies that I bring to you today is interesting because it's what Francesco said, one which is focused on infrastructure and the other also on green energy and energy transformation. So my uh, first panelist for today is Georgia. And uh, Georgia is the International Business Development Manager of IQT Consulting SPA. Uh, it focuses on engineering infrastructure and it's deemed to be one of the top Italian engineering companies and they are looking to invest in the Indian markets and Georgia has spent many months in India investigating the Indian markets so she'll give you a very good idea of what potential she sees for her company in the Indian markets. Welcome Georgia and uh, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you Divya. Let me share my screen. And we will start. Okay, can you can you see me? Yes. yes. Okay. So first of all, thanks to to Divya and uh, Gaia to also to the DB Group uh, all for this opportunity. We are glad to share uh, with uh, with all of you the the key trends in the engineering service sector in India. All of them. Uh, uh, have been relevant and strategic for the international process of IQT. For uh, just a better understanding, let me have a very, very quick brief uh, regarding our company, who we are, uh, what we do, and why we are exploring the Indian country. Uh, IQT is an engineering firm, an engineering Italian firm specialized on engineering infrastructure. So we are not a manufacturing company, but we guarantee high quality engineering services in different sectors. We are able to perform each project from the preliminary detailed design to the construction and the supervision at site. Our headquarters is in the Northeast of Italy, but we can cover all the country with seven offices in Italy and we are more than 300 people. So uh, our main focus is on uh, four business units. Uh, it, they are very important to understand how our path in, in, India, in India continent. So the first one is the green energy and utilities. I mean, uh, uh, water treatment, waste treatment, uh, uh, sewerage and, and so on. Smart TLC infrastructures and NEGAN and mobile telecommunication networks, landslide and geotechnical design. Finally, uh, smart buildings where we are focused on. Um, we could guarantee more than 5,000 projects per year developed by more than 300 people. All of them are engineers and architects. But now um, let, me, let me explain why IQT is exploring uh, the Indian market uh, since uh, more or less uh, one, uh, one year and a half. First of all, despite the rejection, India had one of the highest increase in terms of direct investment, both local and foreign. During the uh, last year, 2020, the increase, uh, for example, of direct foreign investment in India was plus 13%. Means that uh, from all the world, there is a great expectation on India in the medium and long term and uh, India has been considered a strategic market for different sectors. Again, despite of the complexity of the country, it is very uh, easy to see a great opportunity in green economy, energy transition and infrastructure sectors. This area will grow in terms of opportunity, in terms of partnership and in terms of sustainability. In light of this, uh, uh, there are several of main uh, um, project in India and uh, uh, let me see also that uh, several or main our client in Italy like uh, ENI, NA Green Power, Snamrete Gas are still present in India and they are investing a lot. So as I said before uh, sustainable development is the priority of the India, is the priority of the Europe but it's the priority also our company. Ecological and uh, digital transition are 
one of uh, main, our main focus and you can see um, what type of, of project in India is, is, uh, is developing. For just for an example, JJM mission is a, in a drinking water mission. It has uh, 7 billion of uh, USD for the next two years. The urban transformation mission Amrut has a budget of 1 million for next year and a smart city budget for more than 100 cities is uh, uh, around, uh, around 31 billion of uh, investment. So uh, let me say that IQT is very focused on this attractive scenario and uh, multi-sector uh, uh, services opportunities. Just to, be, just to have a, a big picture for uh, the consulting overview of um, uh, Indian market is interesting to see that uh, more than 10,000 setup are present in, in India until now, and uh, most of them are based in Delhi. In Delhi, the value, the value, the total value of Indian consultancy now is more than 10 billion USD, uh, with an attractive percentage of annual growth rate around 30 percent. So, as a sector of opportunities that we can see, and uh, we have uh, done a, a short selection for, uh, for our company, you can see that uh, the, in, in line with the, the plan of uh, uh, investment of Indian government, uh, we will be focused on uh, urban infrastructure, utilities, waste management, water and uh, water treatment, and uh, uh, green, big, green big project like uh, JJM and uh, or Arnold. So our effort uh, for the near future will be dedicated to all these activities that could be developed for uh, this type of project that I had mentioned before. Um, finally, what can we can do? What we guarantee for uh, Indian market? Uh, all of these type of services from uh, uh, feasibility, preliminary detail design, uh, independent engineer, third party monitoring, bread bid and due diligence. These type of services are very, very um, services of niche in, in India because the high quality of the uh, Italian engineering appeal is very, very looking for in, uh, in India. So in line with uh, what they say till now, the focus of our customer target is uh, uh, on key development agency of government, provincial government, and city agencies, APC players, all that we can guarantee this type of project. So this is our main focus in India and we will grow for sure in the next year. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Georgia. That was really uh, interesting, especially knowing the fact that the sustainability, green infrastructure, this is one of the key points for the growth of the Indian economy, and it's been heavily focused on in the past year or so, I would say. Uh, thank you for sharing your valuable insight. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop us your questions and we'll get back to you at the end of all the panels uh, are completed. And now I will move on to our next speaker, who is Mr. Enrico Camerati, who is the business uh, development head APAC of Copron. Uh, Copron is an industrial logistics company. Again, um, they focus again on infrastructure and something again, which is very relevant for the Indian economy. And he will be sharing his insights on what future he sees for his company in the Indian economy. Welcome, Enrico, and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much. And thanks for the invitation. It's the first time for me to participate to your webinar. So and thanks again. Uh, let's see if we can, uh, you know, manage the, the slide because we need to handle in remote. But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm not in India. I'm in, I'm in Guangzhou anyway. So I, I would like to be closer to India. So I moved to the south of China today. <laughs> and uh, okay, let's talk about uh, the, I mean, for our for our company, the India is uh, at the moment is a feasibility study. So what I would like to to explain you quickly today is uh, the basis and the the main idea that that are uh, you know uh, kind of uh, supporting our development of the potential development in India. Here is uh, very quickly the numbers of a company. It's Italian company. They are. Uh, the presence for the production site is in Italy, France. Then there are two sites, uh, one in Brazil, very successful, one in China, very unsuccessful. 
and uh, later I explain you why I mentioned this point. Uh, these are some numbers. Basically, what we do, uh, we are specialized. The, the headquarters is in Milano. There are already 14, 39 years uh, of uh, operation of this company. The core business uh, is the industrial logistic, which means uh, warehouses and also system for the loading, unloading, and industrial doors. So everything used for logistic uh, uh, factories uh, and uh, warehouses, similar similar construction. But then uh, with the years, uh, we develop more the, let's say, other business unit that are in a certain way more uh, uh, fancy or more interesting or more, you know, uh, close to the, to the consumer, like uh, living and events for uh, retail and agro energy. Uh, then if we go to the case of India, okay, I don't want to repeat uh, something that uh, some panelists already talked before me, but anyway, I think there are two points uh, to point out. For sure, India sooner or later will become, uh, a, it's already, but will become more and more a, a key, uh, key area for the companies uh, and specifically for the European company. Uh, here, okay, I put some numbers about the make in India and the, 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 the growth of India before the pandemic and hopefully after the pandemic. But if we go specifically to the, to the relationship with the Europe, between Europe and India, two points I think we need to underline. The first is that, is that at the moment, then maybe things will change, but at the moment, uh, uh, due to the political position or international position of India, Probably India has to look to the West, they cannot see to the East uh, for, for several reasons. Probably there will be a lot of opportunity for American company for sure, especially because they are trying to strengthen the relationship with India, but also for the, for the, for the European uh, Union company, especially if they will go to sign the, the finally the global trade agreement that they are, they are negotiating in this period. Uh, but uh, going back to the company side, uh, uh, I pointed out uh, some uh, some main opportunity for Copeland. Okay, before uh, uh, before someone already mentioned some some uh, uh, some uh, sector, but I would like to point it out specifically three or four. The first the first is food food processing because they need uh, this kind of business uh, uh, kind of a high level uh, solution uh, to prevent uh, you know the pollution the the uh, follow the regulation for the health and so on. The same for the pharmaceutical uh, that is already probably India, I guess, is already the number one in the world in terms of, of pharma that they produce, but will boom again more and more. And uh, e-commerce. E-commerce with an advantage compared to China, where uh, the, the market is already very well developed. Uh, India has a lot of, uh, still a lot of space. Uh, for the facility for the e-commerce and more important uh, at least uh, some of them some uh, bigger players they are international players uh, in our case uh, we had a big deal uh, recently with uh, uh, with uh, with amazon in brazil uh, which is much easier to manage than the the, the chinese uh, platform and the chinese infrastructure related to the e-commerce like alibaba or like uh, jindong or whatever the last is uh, as i told you is more for the for uh, other not industrial, like the retailer, someone before talked about fashion and events and the sport where we, we are very strong in Europe. And uh, to, to move quickly, um, uh, this is just uh, to summarize that we have uh, two different, uh, let's say, business unit. One is the core and is the industrial, and the other one are the not industrial product that sometimes is more for marketing or for the, the positioning of the brand than, than the real business. Because definitely, I guess that even in India, like in China, the key business will be the, the industrial solution. Uh, and uh, and uh, moving a little bit further, uh, related to, okay, this is just the summary of some product. So you, you can see that the, the first line of the industrial product and is the key business. And then there are other, other, other business units uh, which are more for the consumer. Uh, and uh, going back to India, uh, as I told you, we are in the phase of uh, develop, uh, trying to develop a clear and uh, effective and a serious uh, uh, feasibility study. I would say not like happened in China 15 years ago, where I, be, I was not there, but I guess uh, my company came not with not very clear idea about the 
consciousness. I want to mention a couple of points. For example, one may, our main uh, uh, sector all around the world are the warehouses, but uh, the warehouses is not a business in China, both because we are not competitive, and second, because for the culture and for the regulation of China, there are much better solution and, uh, and uh, even sometimes cheaper or anyway, more, uh, more uh, uh, closer to the culture of the Chinese uh, uh, construction company than our PVC warehouses or even the panel warehouses, okay? Uh, this, so it will be important to clarify and to understand clearly what the Indian market wants. Uh, the other point uh, is in the next uh, slide. Uh, okay, the marketing and uh, promotional activity for sure, but the two other, two other uh, mistakes that we cannot do in India uh, taking, uh, I mean, uh, uh, considering uh, the experience of China, the negative, but also the very positive in Brazil, is that we have to focus immediately on two aspects. The first is the sales and the commercial structure. No matter if we are present directly and personally or not in the first phase on in, China, uh, in India, but will be necessary to establish uh, uh, a very clear and uh, and long term relationship with the dealer with the distributor and the second point uh, is uh, the installation and the after sales uh, services because for our product is absolutely necessary and uh, we are facing uh, uh, in some country big problems where we don't have a direct presence which means uh, most of the country by the way um, and the, the, the third point is the, the opportunity to be present also online for some simple products or whatever. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, we would like to, to, to try to, to study well at this, this point that I mentioned in the feasibility study. And the first step will be to set up a commercial and after sales activity. At the moment, we are already selling in, in India, but compared to other countries like Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, much less. And the, mainly the problem is the, the reliability or the capacity to deal with the, real, with the let's say, a serious and reliable partner in India, especially in the, in the sales and after sales service. So this is one point that we will have to to tackle and to solve uh, as soon as the COVID will disappear, will be easier to move and, uh, and be present on the, on the territory. And the second phase for sure will be to eventually, hopefully to establish our direct operation, even smaller they are. Uh, because, uh, uh, and just to close, uh, I go back to the, to the slide that we couldn't show because there is a problem in the PPT. Okay, these are our clients, but uh, the idea is to match uh, the three pillars of our company. We have the head and the brand and the technology in India. But meanwhile, we have the capacity to, de to design for, let's say, less developed country like Brazil. And we have the capacity to manufacture directly or through the, the supply chain OEM in China, uh, a lot of product. All these three pillars put together, probably ca they can afford and they can, uh, let's say, fit with the Indian market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Enrico. And uh, thanks also to Georgia and Divya. Now we will pass to our last focus on, uh, I believe, the one of the most emerging country, which uh, also thanks to the recent, recent uh, EVFTA is seeing a uh, growing interest for the inbound investments. I am uh, glad to let our friend, Mr. Michele Dercole, who is the chairman of the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, the opening remarks for our discussion about Vietnam. Please, Michele, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks, Veronica. And of course, thanks to the DAP Group for organizing this very interesting panel today. You know, I already attended many, many times through this many times for this uh, DAP group uh, webinar. Of course, thanks to the other, my colleague panelists, my friends from uh, China, Mr. Paolo, also Mr. Variale from India. So I got Vietnam. Even last year was quite uh, complicated for everyone for the pandemic, but Vietnam was most, one of the few countries to have a positive GDP, 2.9% growing. And still this year have a positive result uh, with the GDP on the first quarter with 4.48%. Even if now, uh, at least during these days, the situation of pandemic is not uh, very well, you know, we have another uh, small wave, 
but uh, the, 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 the government in Vietnam, they facing a very well the situation, at least the local market uh, still quite strong because even during the lockdown, they never closed the factories. So this was a very good option for them to keep the growing of the activities of the economy, of the economy positive data. So about some um, economic outlook, Vietnam is expanding, uh, expanding labor supply. The population is still growing. And they expect to reach uh, 100 million in 2024. And also, we are in the middle of, I can say, the golden age because over 70% of the population is uh, represented is in the working is the working age. So this is very positive uh, uh, number. Then urbanization growth. Urban population is expected to increase with the growth approximately 27% to reach about 40 million urban residents of the next five years. So this is very important for the growing, fastest growing, fastest growing middle classes. And this will help a lot. One of the most fastest growing the Asian country. The GDP, as I mentioned before, they're still growing. Uh, they expect it to have an average, say, 6.5% for the next uh, four years. And they expect it to, to grow uh, much more the post-COVID situation. Regarding the incoming growth, also for the incoming growth, they're still growing 7% yearly. And this will be help also to the consumer spending demand, demand especially in the retail business. Also about investment, you know, Vietnam attract about, uh, since 2013, about an average of increasing 10% per year. And in 2019 is the, you know, the latest, uh, uh, I can say normal data, they reach over $38 billion for investor year in, in, uh, in Vietnam. Also about, you know, the numbers of this uh, first quarter, we have uh, uh, Vietnam export about $78 billion and import 76. Most of the product for export are the telephone and computers, the ITC, because Vietnam became one of the biggest hub like Samsung, LG, Canon, Panasonic, they invest a lot in Intel. That's why one of the first product on the I ITC product, but also still in the manufacturing sector, like garment, textile, footwear, and furniture, they still have a big number for export. About import, of course, they import more or less the raw material they need to produce here for electronic, electric components or machinery or textile on plastic material. About the country, the top number five country for import, they import from China, number one country, then South Korea, and then the Asian country and Japan and Europe. And about the export, the number one now became US, the United States of America. The first quarter is the number one country for export for Vietnam, then China, Europe, ASEAN, and, and South Korea. We told, just mentioned a few words about Italy. Italy is one of the most important partners in Vietnam as a European country. The bilateral trade is about $4.6 billion. Uh, but the trade balance is on the favor of Vietnam. In fact, Italy export to Vietnam about $1.2 billion, mainly machinery is number one product, machinery for food, machinery for food processing, for furniture, for textile, then leather accessories, and then chemical, textile, and of course, food and beverage. And then about import, as, as Vietnam became the number one hub for electronics, of course, computer, and then the leather article, all the agricultural product, garment, and machinery. But one of the most important things some of my previous panelists already mentioned, Vietnam has signed 14 free trade agreement. And the latest one was the August last year with Europe. So that's why the Europe and Italy, of course, will have a lot of advantage because in a few years, 99% of the tariff of bilateral product will reduce to zero. So we'll have a big advantage for our Italian and economy to export and to sell here in Vietnam. But of course, 14 free trade agreement means also with all the Asian country, and of course, and China, Japan, India, South Korea, Hong Kong, but also with the Euro-Asian and also with the UK just the latest because UK is not more part of Europe. So they signed the FTA with them just one month ago. 
About the sectors, some of my colleagues already mentioned the green economy, also Vietnam pushing a lot in green economy, in uh, wind and solar power, especially solar power, when Italy is one of the leaders in the world for that. And then also circular economy of waste treatment. Of course, apparel and footwear remain strong. Machinery, pharmaceutical is very important. Furniture, fashion, still our number one for Italian made in Italy, infrastructure, but it's very important that Vietnam would like to, to continue to grow, also take care about the clean sector. And I think that Italy will be very strong also in this sector, even in the famous and the traditional, the traditional one. So just this is few words about Vietnam. Of course, I'm available for any question. And of course, the chamber is available to help the Italian business to do business here. As chamber, we are growing a lot in the last year about digital services. As you know, it's impossible to travel. Also arriving in Vietnam, we need a quarantine over three weeks, plus one week now is one month. So very complicated, but we will try to push it to attract more Italian business here. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Michele. Uh, now let's pass uh, directly to the panel. Mm, for Vietnam, our legal advisor, in, uh, who is in Hanoi, uh, Mr. Filippo, Filippo Scaglia, will lead the panelists through the discussion. Filippo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Michele, for the introduction. And uh, yes, let's clear open the Vietnam panel. And uh, today we're going to discuss with uh, some of the representative of Italian companies that are here in Vietnam. And let me just add you some uh, small introduction of the country to the one Michele just did. Uh, we've seen, uh, let's say that Vietnam has been uh, under the radar for the last uh, five years, 10 years, uh, mostly because of the uh, so-called China plus one strategy, meaning that uh, uh, some of the companies that were, uh, were are still located, uh, they have the production facilities uh, in China, they're looking to a second production site in Asia to serve not only the Southeast Asian market, but also the world that has connection with uh, the Europe, US. Uh, and Vietnam uh, is uh, one of the most, uh, the top relocation site because of the strategic location, because of the uh, local labor, because of the many free trade agreements that has with uh, different uh, country in, in all over the world, and while still being a country, a country and an emerging uh, economy, uh, we can say that we have seen the, all the phases of the industrialization here, because uh, uh, the companies that entered, the, the foreign companies that entered Vietnam uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, were mainly in the head manufacturing uh, uh, sector, while recently, as Michele was before, is uh, push the foreign investment in uh, more uh, uh, green and you know, high-tech uh, technologies. So uh, we have companies such as uh, Samsung or uh, you know, that are moving their production site, production facilities in Vietnam, in the north uh, or in the south. Uh, it's, uh, every, they are more welcome to where it is. So today we have the privileges, the privilege of the uh, of the two Italian companies, uh, which are uh, Ariston Thermo, the uh, Copan, and uh, even if uh, they both are uh, excellence and the leader in the, the sector, they come from different uh, uh, sector, they have different products, uh, and uh, it will be interesting to see the different strategies uh, that uh, have been uh, made. To approach this market because uh, Ariston has a long, uh, uh, long experience in the country, while Copan is uh, only recently approaching the market. So I believe it's going to be interesting to have two different uh, perspectives uh, from Italian companies approaching the Vietnamese market. So with this, uh, I give the floor to Michele Lanchetti of Copan. So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, it's very well said, Filippo. We are very new and fresh to the Vietnamese, uh, to the Vietnamese market. 
meaning that we reached China. Uh, I reached China in 2016, where I built the first uh, branch of Copa manufacturing uh, facility. What we do is uh, the swab medical devices that are now extremely famous all around the world. Well, not just ours actually, but uh, the things that they have been stuck up to your nose or mouth to to see if you are any kind of disease and anything called it. So of course, imagine the spur that we had of our production during 2020 and 2021 as well. So we are in the biggest market of the world, yes, but it's also one of the biggest manufacturing places of the world. And of course, needless to say, although ours is a medical device, it's a mass producing medical device. It's just like a QT, a bit more complex, but that's what it is. So prices are going down dramatically. Quality, of course, is not as good, but for in terms of emergency times, such as COVID, people don't really look for, uh, for quality, but rather for quantity. So we were thinking actually, even before the COVID started to find a location for increasing our production for the whole of uh, ASPAC region. And we were not really pleased here with the uh, regulatory environment here in China. We are a medical device company, so before we deploy our products in the market, we need to apply for a registration to the certifying bodies. Which, remember I said I started in 2016 in China, we will be allowed to uh, produce the Made in China product in June 2021. So imagine to, to have to increase the production of new products, possibly how long it's going to take. This is a huge barrier uh, for entry. So we had to look around for alternatives as well. And of course, Vietnam was the first one. For Asia, it's actually, it's the strategy of Asia. It would be probably Vietnam plus one, the other way around. Because China will remain focused just for the Chinese market, which before was also said that is a continent by itself because they play by their own rules. While Vietnam, it definitely helps because we will be most likely going to be to Hanoi, so you can move by, by truck to so many regions or by sea and reach the Southeast Asia way more quicker than if I was in, in China. Nonetheless, China is seeing uh, quite uh, a steep increase of main work, uh, main work hour price, which Vietnam has not seen yet. Hopefully it will as well. But also, I've seen a lot of much more receptions in terms of uh, uh, welcoming new companies approaching the market. There's still a need to grow up together with the country. Rather, when when we come to we came to China, we are we are felt and we are still felt as one more foreigner. So those are the wider spectrum of reason why we, we chose to get done. But less also they have and industrial power that actually are helping the companies that are into particular sectors to have big tax deductions and uh, in so in so many ways, which are also are in China, but never in tier one city like Shanghai. So we would have to relocate into remote areas in China to obtain the same standards of uh, tax production that we can obtain either in Washington city or Hanoi. So, Basically, the strategy would be to bring our main production lines of the most uh, automatized productions, which is the swap, and then uh, into Vietnam. And then with that, all the packaging as well of some of our lines, which are actually the most uh, man-consuming uh, man activities. However, we require a lot of manufacturing capabilities. So, one reason more why we're moving to Vietnam is exactly that. We, we are comforted by uh, the, the previous research is that we, we are comforted that we are gonna find the needed uh, human resources. We are comforted by the fact that the level of English is also uh, astonishingly good, especially if you compare it to China, I have to be quite frank. And uh, so it, it really felt not only because of the macroeconomic aspects of the country rising and with the GDP that is uh, still booming and so on and so forth. That is something that might not affect us because eventually it's not going to be our number one market for our products. Rather, it is going to be for the whole of the region. And uh, the, the nail that closed the coffin for our decision was also eventually the, the, the 
the ratification of free trade agreement with, with Europe, of course. So that gave us just the, the cherry on top of the cake. I said, okay, but this is where we have to go. And if I had to recommend to friends where to open up the next new company, it would definitely be uh, Vietnam, way, way more than uh, way more than China. It is still really a developing economy, and there is way much more space for, for, for new enterprises. Thank you. Thank you, Michele, for sharing your uh, perspective on uh, approaching the market and to share also which are the pros and the cons uh, of uh, both uh, Vietnam and, and China. And now I will leave the floor to Mr. Alessio Magnavacca, Magnavacca of uh, Ariston Group. Alessio. Hi, everyone, and thanks, uh, Filippo, for uh, inviting and for uh, uh, having me in this uh, conference. I'm trying to share my screen. Hope you guys can see. Uh, I'm uh, the country manager here at Ariston Thermo uh, Vietnam. Sorry, let me share my screen. I'm the country manager at Ariston Thermo Vietnam. We have been in this country for over 30 years. Uh, uh, by now, we started uh, our adventure in Vietnam in 1988 and over time uh, we have uh, expanded our operation locally. We have a, a major manufacturing hub uh, in the area north of Hanoi uh, plus uh, uh, sales operations in the full country where we are now a market leader. So we have quite, a, quite an extensive experience and what I would like to share today uh, with this group uh, is a bit of the uh, learning that we, we got in uh, the many years uh, in this country. Uh, just to introduce what we do uh, in, in our company. Uh, we sell uh, water heaters, so we are the source of hot water in the house of uh, Vietnamese families and, and many other families in, around the world, uh, which means we sell uh, products that go typically either in the bathroom to do hot showers or they go on the roof as solar water heaters or they are um, systems that can provide hot water for a full building, uh, for a resort, uh, for a school, uh, for, for a military installations that are heat pumps and renewable technologies. Uh, it's interesting to, to say that we are considered a, a, a home appliance in Vietnam, uh, not much of a system, so we are considered like a, a fridge or a washing machine. Now, three things uh, that we learned uh, over time uh, that are uh, important for uh, anyone in, in this webinar or anyone interested to do business in Vietnam, and they are, say, on top of the uh, obvious, uh, of course, challenges and opportunities of uh, fast-growing markets uh, like this one. Now, number one, the, uh, the product features in Vietnam are important, are still very important, and quality and durability are key drivers in most product categories. Uh, the Vietnamese customers value very much uh, this. Uh, the second uh, thing that I would like to share is that when products are not well understood, which is quite often, a uh, brand play a very key role in the choice of a Vietnamese consumer more than in other markets where Ariston Thermo is working. Uh, and finally, it's not enough to win the uh, end consumer for brands uh, that are looking to win consumers, but distribution networks uh, are uh, uh, really a competitive advantage and it's really, really difficult to be the one uh, that can uh, spam such a, a relatively low urbanized country as is Vietnam. Uh, I'll give you a few more details on, on this point. So uh, the first point, uh, why quality and reliability are still very important in Vietnam is because the Vietnamese consumer uh, comes from a, uh, a fast developing curve and not more than 30 years ago, they were still suffering from the aftermath of, of the war, uh, which means that the discretionary spending is still quite limited uh, for the Vietnamese families. For most regions, uh, discretionary spending is below 20% of, uh, of the salary that they achieve. So when they get a product, they really value a lot how long it will last and the quality of it. Uh, to the point that in Vietnam, it's quite common to test products before you buy. Uh, so they actually connect them to the power grid, for example, to see if it's working. Uh, this means that companies that want to be successful here uh, need to offer that kind of quality. Uh, partially, uh, they need to offer the kind of quality that we are experienced in Europe or in the United States. Uh, the, the Vietnamese consumer does this in most products. Uh, not only in our categories uh, where water eating, of course, uh, are exposed often to severe weather conditions, but for example, also in clothing and uh, fashion, where the quality of shoes and, and clothes is perceived. Then, of course, 
uh, the, the income in the market does not allow everyone to assess this, that is highly valued. Now, when the quality and the product features are not working, brand play a very important role in Vietnam. There is kind of a, a relatively closed market. Uh, I'm showing you here the results of a survey that we, a market research that Ariston has run uh, in this January 2020, so not, not more than one year ago, uh, where we asked uh, uh, the source, uh, how important is, a pro is the source of the product and how we prone that is the relatively difference between different countries. Uh, and you see that most for most uh, uh, consumers, uh, they will decide about a product uh, as much as 30% just based on the brand. And for the audience in this, in this webinar, uh, I think we should be happy to say that uh, Italy, by its uh, the Italian brand, are second only to American and Japanese brand in Vietnam, uh, much better than French brand, German brands, and other Asian brands. Uh, that gives an idea of how much the Vietnamese uh, consumers are keen to brands. Uh, Italian products have been in this market for long uh, and they have always uh, given that kind of quality and uh, uh, successful features uh, to the consumers that they were looking for, better than other countries, uh, I guess, uh, despite the fact that we are, we have a lower, a smaller uh, system uh, to support our brands. So brands are important and Italian uh, are considered a very strong brand. Uh, finally, uh, it's not enough to win consumer. But this is a very, relatively, very, if you are working here, a relatively low urbanized country. Uh, the, 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 there are many policies from the government that uh, prevent uh, free movement of people across provinces. We don't have mega cities like in China or in Indonesia or in Malaysia uh, or in Africa or the Middle East uh, uh, to expand the scope. So uh, you need to get to every single city to uh, offer your products. And I show you a small animation. This is our distribution network in the provinces in the north. You kind of get an idea of how many retail stores we need to control and how uh, detailed we need to be in their position uh, and be, be making sure they are, uh, we are covering all the different villages and cities and so on. Now, building this distribution network takes a long time and uh, uh, it is a competitive advantage now in on my company of Ariston Thermal where we reached nearly 5,000 stores. And we have seen many companies failing uh, to enter the market because they failed to develop this distribution network. Big brands, even like Electrolux, in the home appliance sector that didn't manage to go all the way uh, to, to the small villages, to the small provinces uh, where a lot of the population is. Uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Da Nang and Hanoi uh, make up less than 30% of the total population uh, of this country. And Michele was saying, we're gonna get 100 million, they make less than 30 million. So getting there, being able to reach with our logistic and supply chain uh, uh, team uh, by reaching all of these stores and making sure we are present and our brand is sustained there has proven to be a competitive advantage and I will recommend to any company that wants to enter to crack the code here because uh, uh, again it's it's a market where most of the population is in provinces. So these are the three learning that I will share for Ariston uh, uh, for, for our 30 years in this market and uh, hopefully that will make us successful in the future. Filippo back to you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Filippo. Thank you, Filippo, Alessio, and uh, thanks uh, also to Michele for uh, all the uh, very uh, valuable insights. Now I will um, give the floor uh, back to Gaia for uh, the Q&A session. Thanks, Gaia. Of course. And first of all, thank you very much to all our speakers, because I really do believe that this was one of the most interesting webinars we held so far, especially, you know, to have all these different perspectives from such key industries, especially Italian companies operating in such relevant markets these days. Now, um, I received a few questions that I would like to just go through possibly again China, India, Vietnam. We have 10 minutes until the uh, end of the webinar and I would like to go first to Mr. Paolo Bazzoni from China because we have a very interesting question that I think it's uh, very relevant for many companies both already in China and also for those that want to start investing in here. 
And especially uh, they asked how the investing approach has changed in the last years and how the local market is more demanding towards foreign investors. So if you have any insights from your perspective as uh, president mm -hmm. of the China ITP Chamber of Commerce, please share them with us. Uh, I think everybody's very interested. Thank you. Well, uh, on the question, I, I would like to, to drive my answer uh, to the fact that uh, the majority of Italian companies localized in China invested in China more than 10 years ago. This is a key success factor. They positioned the themselves, the quality into Chinese market before the market uh, became, uh, let's say, uh, attracting for the uh, quality uh, technology and innovation. Italian company, in companies are, uh, let's say, quality in itself. So this uh, majority of industrial mechanic components, automotive invested in China because they were, their brand was already uh, popular in the globalized world. They came to China, they fight, they localized, they invested, and now they are very well positioned in the Chinese market. Talking about industrial companies, if we talk about quality retail companies, this is the new trend, okay? Of course, the big brands already arrived in China through distribution, and because they, they follow the, the consumer goods. But now is the moment to invest. What I said before is the moment to invest in China for quality uh, solutions, okay? Definitely, if a small company never approached China, industrial company is becoming more difficult now, unless, unless the company has a specific technical innovative solution it can sell or it can participate with Chinese company. Different story is for uh, fashion furniture design. Of course, now is, is the moment and lifestyle. So I would divide the, 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 the feedback. It depends on the sector you are in, okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, come to China, the biggest uh, market in the world, needs uh, someone to escort you advise you, uh, protect you, not only from a uh, legal point of view, tax point of view, but from a local culture integration point of view. This is the role of the chamber. And uh, working together with uh, you know, consulates and embassy can have a safety net for the, for the PMI especially. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I completely agree, of course, with you and your last point that I see also often as, as a consultant, we see how many companies want to approach the Chinese market, but they very much underestimate the difficulty of navigating such complexity. So for sure, um, that's also why we invited the chamber, the representatives of the chambers of commerce today, because of course you're the expert, and for sure uh, you've been supporting Italian and foreign companies uh, in general for a very long time. And that said, uh, well, thank you once again. Now I would move to Giorgia Vignato uh, because we received a question that I think you're the perfect uh, person to ask you because they're asking what are the current challenges an infrastructure company faces while operating in India? Well, uh, first of all, the, the, the presence of large local players. No? There are a lot of large local players, huge local players in, uh, in India. So uh, need uh, investment in the country and uh, also for the agreement with the industrial companies with local um, issues no uh, so in, for this case in this case uh, sometimes it's difficult to participate in, in uh, public tenders uh, it is essential to have a, a local partner a strong local partner that uh, can help uh, uh, the, the, the company to develop the, the, the presence uh, in, uh, in this type of sectors. Because uh, uh, India is a very um, fragmented uh, markets for uh, this type of services. 
So, but if you, if you have high quality, if you have uh, uh, the engineering uh, um, services that you can perform, I think that uh, with the, the right investment and the right, uh, in the right time with the right people, it is uh, easier to, to, to go to, through the, the, the infrastructure market. So very much, um, and for sure, yes. I think you know, same as for China. I guess, as you said, also for India, it's really important to find a local partner to support in the establishment of foreign companies in such uh, difficult markets. And now to conclude, I have a question that I think can be addressed by two speakers. So we have three minutes left. So let's say a minute and a half each, even though the question is very broad. So to Michele Dercole and Alessio Magnavacca. So we have been asked if uh, for example, you, since you're based in Vietnam already for many years, uh, especially within you know the last month since the EU VFTA has been approved, if you have already seen any significant impact. So that's why it would be interesting to see both the Chamber of Commerce perspective and of course also Ariston Thermo since, you know, as you said, you've been in uh, Vietnam for a long time. So maybe let's go first to Michele and then to Alessio conclusion. And yeah, one minute and a half each, let's try to, to make it. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Guy. And even the FTA with Euro was signed 1st August 2020. We already have a positive result. This is the export from Europe to Vietnam already grow double digit. So this means the result is already positive because some of the product already have uh, zero duty. And uh, since uh, 1st January 2021, other product has slowly reduced the tariff because as I mentioned before, in seven years, in all, almost 90% of the tariff will be zero. Some very few of them in 10 years included automotive because automotive sector is one of the most sensitive. And also product with super uh, wine, uh, also that product, they extend for 10 years, but most of the other product they reduce. So I already saw some forecast, some data of export and they mentioned already the very positive result. One of the most important thing will be also on the FTA that the Vietnamese company, we are obliged to improve their quality if they would like to export the product to Europe and in Italy. So I also in this, in this for, for this, the Italian company were a very big important presence to improve the quality of the local Vietnamese company with the machinery, with the service, if the Vietnamese would, inc would increase of course, from their side. But for Europe, for sure, and also for Italy, very good sign, positive sign we already seen. Great, thank you very much for these insights. Um, and now you, Alessio, for example, from your company perspective, or at least within your industry, do you also have any perception of, you know, any significant impact? Well, from our side, most of our uh, suppliers are already localized or as much as possible. So we have not seen a direct impact yet uh, of the EFTA as we produce locally or what we import uh, is not yet uh, uh, in the tariff uh, extension uh, program. It will come later in the years. What we have seen as an improvement uh, is uh, the ability to uh, structure better and clarify uh, custom processes because the uh, EFTA is also defining rules uh, for uh, to applying the custom duties and the way that uh, certificates should be handled. Uh, there was a bit of a mess before. I mean, it was manageable for, with a bit of experience, but uh, this is improving and we already see that kind of improvement. So the, the Vietnamese customs are becoming more used to follow the new processes and new guidelines. Perfect, thank you. And as I see, we are perfectly on time today. So thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, first of all, for, for joining, it's been a real pleasure. Um, so as always, especially institutional support, as we always receive from uh, you know, Vietnam with Michele D'Ercole, then Paolo Bazzoni China and Francesco Varialli from India today. Our speakers are still connected here. So Giorgio Vignato, Alessio Magnavacca, Enrico Camurati, uh, Michele Bianchietti. And then in the meanwhile, Fabrizio Cazzoli, uh, unfortunately, had another meeting, so he had to uh, leave and then of course final but you know not least um, my colleagues here with me from Shanghai and then Filippo from our Hanoi office and Veronica from Milan. Uh, with this I will conclude today's webinar.
I hope you will you I hope you enjoyed it and of course it will also be available on our social media and then uh, please you know stay tuned for upcoming events and hope to see you soon. Thank you and thank bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao Michele, ciao.